Our attitude determines whether we choose to read or not, whether we decide to try or give up, and whether we blame ourselves or others for failure. It dictates whether we tell the truth or lie, act or procrastinate, advance or recede. Ultimately, our attitude alone determines our success or failure. With the right attitude, humans can move mountains. With the wrong attitude, they can be crushed by the smallest grain of sand. Achievers possess a can-do attitude that distinguishes them from mere dreamers. They are committed to success regardless of obstacles and are willing to exert effort and pay the price for it. Attitude drives actions, actions drive results, and results drive lifestyle. The only constant in life is our feelings and attitudes toward it. Our attitude is one of the few things we have total control over. While discussing the negative may not always be pleasant, it's necessary because it's part of life. Attitude issues are akin to weeds in a garden. They're a normal part of life. Remember, negativity is normal. It's not ideal, but it's part of life. In my opinion, we must learn to handle the negative. We shouldn't ignore it. Instead, we should listen to various perspectives and make our own decisions. Don't just follow, be a student. Some may advise ignoring the weeds, but they'll eventually take over your garden. So, you must handle the negative. This brings me to what I call the great war between good and evil. From the moment we're born, we're part of the struggle between good and evil, darkness and light, negative and positive. The war is ongoing, a mental, physical and financial war between enterprise and ease, between accomplishment and failure. That's why the Old Testament phrase, six days labor, one day rest, is so pertinent. It means enterprise is better than ease. If you rest too long, the jungle overtakes the village. Evil may seem formidable, but it's no match for good. However, good must be active. Weeds are no match for human activity. But if you stay still, how far in will they come? All the way. They'll grow right up around your shoes. But if you get busy, how far back can you take them? As far as you wish. They are no match, but you must be active. That's why the six and one. Make sure you're not losing the war by taking off too much. Guess what the average years are after retirement? Six, which means don't retire. Your chances are too slim. The war between good and evil, the weeds. You've got to make sure you recognize the negative, handle it, deal with it, and then go on. Let's make a list of the diseases of attitude that can wreck all your chances to do well. One of the words that destroys everything is called neglect. And I found this out. A week of neglect could cost you a year of repair. Is it worth it? So, what to be on the lookout for? Here's the list. If you were making it, you'd have the same list I've got. We're not covering anything new tonight. This is a reminding session, not a teaching session. But it doesn't hurt to go over it again. Here's the list. Attitude diseases. Number one is indifference, the shrug of the shoulder. The guy's not even concerned, he's just drifty. This is called the mild approach to life, a disease known as mildness. The guy says, well, I can't see getting all that worked up. Well, to be any kind of winner, you've got to get worked up. There's one problem with drift. You cannot drift to the top of the mountain. And the good Lord said in the closing chapters of the Bible, here's the best way to live, one way or the other. That's best, hot or what? Next best, cold is next best to hot. Not the half-baked middle, lukewarm. Not too hot, not too cold. What a sad way to live. I think what it means is pick a direction and go with everything you've got. Just pick one and go. Somebody says, yeah, but what if it's the wrong direction? You will find out quicker. It won't take you 25 years to wake up and say, oh no, I've been walking the wrong road. I told my staff the other day, next best to prosperity is adversity. If one doesn't get you, pray for the other. We all do better from one of two reasons, inspiration or desperation. And I don't wish anything bad on you tonight, but if you're not inspired, I hope a wagon comes down your rut. Whatever it takes to get you to try harder, read more, set your goals, and go for it. Somebody asked me one time, what quality would I pick if I wanted to work with somebody? And you know what I picked first? Number one, strong feeling. Please, number one, give me somebody that feels strong about most anything. I don't even care, just so they believe it. Even if they disagree with me, wonderful. Just so they disagree vigorously. 
I'm not saying it's easy to win those kinds of people to your point of view, but I'd rather do that than try to resurrect people from the did pump them up every month, pump them up. I pass pump. Here's the key to the good life. Learn to put everything you've got into everything you do. Whatever you are doing, pour it on. It will quickly open up into opportunity or quickly disclose to you that you ought to be doing something else. The delusion is if I had a better job, I'd really pour it on. See, that's delusion. Wherever you are, pour it on. Don't give somebody half a job for a day's pay. Pour it on. See, that will help change your life. Get rid of this disease. Here's the next attitude disease. Indecision. It's mental paralysis. The guy can't make up his mind, and it becomes a disease. Pretty soon, he knows he's got it. The guy says, well, I know I'm on the fence, but what if I get off on the wrong side? Listen, after a while, it doesn't matter. Just get up. Any side will do. A life full of adventure is a life full of many decisions. The ones that turn out to be wrong give you a better experience to make better decisions. So, don't see how many decisions you can get out of. See how many you can get into. That's where the adventure is. So, shake off this disease, indecision. The next one is doubt. Doubt is like a plague, and one of the worst is self-doubt. There are many, but that's one of the worst. The guy doubts himself, doubts if it will last that long for him. Doubts if he can do that well, doubts if he can make that much, doubts if he can accomplish all that. Chronic, excellent self-doubt. You can imagine what damage that does to your future. So, here's the key. Turn this coin over and become a believer. And there are many things to believe in. One of the majors is yourself. The understanding of self-worth is the beginning of progress. Now, if those three don't get you, this one will. Worry. That's a devastating disease. Worry causes health problems, social problems, personal problems, family problems. It's devastating. Worry long enough, and it'll drop you to your knees, could reduce you to begging. I know how bad this one is. I used to have it bad. I used to be known as a super warrior. Not a super warrior. No, super warrior. My family wished I'd have been a warrior. I've got those years to make up for. But I'll tell you what my advice to you is. You what I finally did on worry, give it up. Who needs it? I'm not saying it's easy, I'm saying it's worth it. It took me almost one year to kick the worry habit, and it was not an easy year. It was one of the toughest years I ever spent. But I finally got that monkey off my back, and I discovered you could live the most incredible life, free of worry. Not free of challenge, not free of difficulty, free of worry. I learned how to do it, and you can. Here's the next attitude disease. Over caution. Some people never will have much, they're too cautious. Now, you can also be too reckless, but you can also be too cautious. This is called the timid approach to life. And my caution was always the risk. Risk used to drive me right up the wall. I used to say, what if this happens? It's called the language of the poor. What if this happens, and on top of that, if this was to happen, look at the fix I will be in. I better not try. I could always ace myself out. Then I'll tell you what changed my whole life. When I finally discovered it's all risky. The minute you were born, it got risky. If you think trying is risky, wait till they hand you the bill for not trying. If you think investing is risky, wait till you get the tab for not investing. See, it's all risky. Getting married is risky. Having children is risky. Going into business is risky. Investing your money is risky. It's all risky. I'll tell you how risky life is. You're not going to get out alive. That's risky. The Englishman says, well, if that's the way it's going to work out, let's give it a go. Right, that's what it's for. Give it a go. Somebody says, yeah, but I'm looking for safety and security. Fine, then huddle in the corner. We'll cover you with a sheet, bring you three meals a day, and we'll protect you, feed you, look after you, care for you. We won't let anything happen to you, and you'll probably live to be 100. The guy said, well, yeah, I'd live to be 100, but what a way to live, right? What a way to live, safe and secure. Don't ask for security, ask for adventure. Better to live 30 years full of adventure than 100 years safe in the corner. And see, it's not important how long you live. What's important is how you live. Here's another attitude problem, pessimism. 
It's about always seeing the downside, the problems, the difficulties, and finding reasons why things won't work. Pessimists live ugly lives, always looking for faults instead of virtues. They're the ones who see specks on the window instead of the sunset. They rush to point out five reasons why something won't work when one would do. For them, the glass is always half empty. Optimists, on the other hand, see the glass as half full. It's all about perspective. Our lives are shaped by how we think things are, not necessarily how they are. There's something called better thinking habits that we don't have time to discuss tonight. But one thing my mentor taught me is that poor thinking habits keep most people poor, not poor working habits. What we think about all day long shapes our lives. As the saying goes, as you think, so you become. I used to start my days reading negative news, but I learned it was poisoning my mind. What we read influences our thoughts, so it's crucial to fill our minds with positive material. I was once asked by students how to build a good life. I said it's simple, simple but not easy. Select the right thoughts and keep out the wrong ones. Life is a mix of sugar and poison, so we must be careful what we let in. Every day, we need to guard our minds against negative influences. We decide what goes into our mental factory because we'll have to live with the results. And finally, the last problem to mention is very brief, the last disease, but this one is deadly. Engage in this one, indulge in it even slightly, and you might as well forget the future because it's going to forget you. Complaining, crying, whining, griping, a Bible word called murmuring. B. That will ace your future. Spend five minutes complaining, and you have wasted five, and you may have begun what's known as economic cancer of the bone. Surely, they will soon haul you off into a financial desert and let you choke on the dust of your own regret. I hope I said that well so you won't forget it. It's a deadly disease. If you don't think it's bad, ask the children of Israel of the Old Testament. Typical of us all, their story just happened to get in the book. The story says the children of Israel were slaves. God performed a series of dazzling miracles and got them out. And now they're heading for the promised land. Remember the story? Heading for the promised land? Tragedy of the story. They never got there. Reason? From day one, they started to complain. They griped about the water. They griped about the weather. They whined and cried and griped about the food. They griped about the leadership. They whined and cried because it was too far, too cold, too hot, too difficult, too miserable. I mean, they whined and cried for years. Finally, God said, I've had it. Trip canceled or something like that. The story says they died in the desert, never got to the promised land. Which I think means two things. Indulge in this long enough, you get your future cast, and I guess it also means even God himself can only take so much. Just be on the lookout for the things that can destroy all the good you start. The war is on, and this evening, tomorrow, mentally, personally, socially, economically, you've got to make sure you're winning the war, and this is part of it. Leadership remains a significant challenge as we transition from the late 90s into the early years of the new century. The challenge spans across various domains, from science to education. It's imperative that we address the shortcomings in our educational programs to avoid falling behind other nations. Remarkable leadership is required in politics, industry, sales, and management. The leadership role is particularly challenging for the next century. Leadership is the challenge to rise above mediocrity, to step up to a new level, a new dimension. This new dimension brings both opportunity and responsibility. Who wouldn't want the responsibility alongside the opportunity if it builds an extraordinary life? Here are some refinements in leadership. Learn to be strong but not rude. Some mistake rudeness for strength, however, we require strength without resorting to rudeness. Learn to be bold but not a bully. Boldness should seize opportunities without resorting to intimidation or bullying. Embrace a new method of leadership. Leadership by invitation. This contrasts with leadership by threat, aggravation, or intimidation. Invite others to adopt a better way of doing things. Practice leadership by inspiration, inspiring others to make necessary changes or accomplish tasks. Be bold but not a bully. Be kind but not weak. Kindness is a strength, not a weakness. Be thoughtful but not lazy. Ponder deeply but also take action. Be humble but not timid. 
Humility is a virtue, while timidity is an obstacle that can be overcome. It's a weakness, not a virtue, but you must turn your timidity into strength and keep working on it until finally, you have driven it into such a small corner that it does not devastate your life anymore. How you use it is a source of teaching. I used to be so shy and so timid, but I worked on it and worked on it until I've driven it into such a small corner it doesn't dominate my life anymore. It's still there, but it doesn't dominate. That's what's important. But humility is a virtue that expands your ability to understand the vastness of it all and how small we are in relation to everything. Humility allows you to get on your knees and talk to a child without any fear. It helps you understand that while humans are unique, in the vastness of it all, we're all pretty small. Yes, we know, but what we don't know is so much greater than what we do know. Here's another point. Be proud without being arrogant. There's something to be said for team pride, community pride, company pride, and personal pride. But don't cross the line where pride turns into arrogance. While some level of confidence is necessary, arrogance is typically a misguided attempt to compensate for a lack of self-worth. Arrogance, especially stemming from ignorance, is particularly troublesome. Smart arrogance may be tolerated, but when someone displays both arrogance and lack of intelligence, it becomes challenging to accept. Therefore, it's essential for all leaders to learn the basic laws, using them for illustration in productivity. Here's the first of the fundamental laws. Whatever you sow, you reap. Now, here's another way to express it on the positive side. In order to reap, you must sow. Reaping is reserved for those who sow, who plant to deserve the harvest. You must plant the seed, take care of it in the summer, carefully harvest it, and then make wise use of the harvest. Here's the rest of the law of sowing and reaping. If you sow good, you reap good. If you sow bad, you reap bad. You can't sow bad and hope for good. You can't plant weeds and hope for flowers. It works both positively and negatively. Now, here's another aspect of the law of sowing and reaping. You don't reap exactly what you sow. That's important to understand. You reap much more than what you sow. If you only reap what you sow, what's the point? No, we don't reap exactly what we sow, we reap much more. Now, here's what's important to understand about that. It works both positively and negatively. The old prophet said, if you sow to the wind, you don't reap a wind, you reap a whirlwind. You have to be careful not to sow to the wind, it doesn't come back as a world. That's on the negative side, but it also works on the positive side. If you plant a cup of corn, how much do you get back? A cup? No, a bushel. For the cup you plant, you get back much more than what you plant. That's the reason for planning for the increase, positive and negative. Now, here's the next key to the law of sowing and reaping. Sometimes, it doesn't work at all. Everybody has to understand. The farmer plants the crop in the spring, takes care of it all summer, is an honorable man, loves his family, is a decent citizen. But the day before he sends the combines into the field, a hailstorm comes along and beats his crop into the ground, and it's gone, lost. So, this time it didn't work. Now what must the farmer do? He's got to decide whether to do it again or not. Should he take another chance in the next spring? We would advise him to do so, even though he lost everything in the last harvest and it didn't work. You don't always reap what you sow. But here's the law of averages. Here's the odds. More often than not, you reap what you sow. More often than not, you'll have a harvest if you plant in the spring. Sure, there's no guarantee, but more often than not, and guess what? More often than not is pretty good odds, better than Las Vegas. The law of sowing and reaping. Fact, one of the most important laws to learn is the law of averages. If you do something often enough, you'll get a ratio of results. Once you understand that, the world is yours. Learning to employ people in the unique thing called the law of averages is stunning in its result in terms of fortune. Let's say you're in sales and you talk to 10 people. Just getting started, if you talk to 10, you get 1. We now have what we call the beginning of a ratio. Saying no one says yes, I'll buy your product, I'll take your service. Somebody says, well, 1 out of 10 isn't that good. Well, you're just getting started, because here's what happens with the law of averages. Once it starts, it tends to continue. If you talk to 10 and get 1, that chance is excellent. Alright, 
You talk to 10 more, you'll get another one. In baseball, we call it batting average. Swing 10 times, get a hit. Swing 10 times, get a hit. Nobody bats 9 out of 10. So, you don't have to be perfect here. All you have to do is understand the law of averages. Now, even if you're only getting 1 out of 10, you can now start to compete. If you've been here a long time, you can get 9 out of 10. If you just joined, you can only get 1 out of 10. I'm telling you, if we have a contest, I will beat you. And you'll say, well, you just started, how could you beat me? It's very simple. If we have a 30-day run on a contest or a 60-day run, while well, you talk to 10 and get 9, I will talk to 100 and get 10. Win, isn't that clever? Here's what I do if I'm new. I make up in numbers what I like in skill. Now, when my skills increase, I don't have to approach 100 to get 10. Once you understand the law of averages, I'm telling you, it's so exciting to work with it. The law of averages works in our little money plan here. You know, chances are excellent that this little plan will work. It'll work, it'll work, it'll work. The ratios will work for you. Here's what else is exciting. The law of averages can be improved. At first, you may only get 1 out of 10, but the better you get, the more skills you develop. Now, you get 2 out of 10, then 3 out of 10. You don't need more than about 2 or 3 out of 10 to get rich. And working with people, there's a unique story about the law of averages. It says the sower went out to sow. Sower number 1 had excellent seed or a great story to tell and a good product to sell. It says that the sower was ambitious, got up early in the morning, and went out to do the deal. So, good seed, ambitious sower, and he starts to sow the seed. But here's what happens. Make a note. The first part of the seed that he sowed, the birds got. And the birds are going to get some. John said, yes, I will come. Check out the meeting, see if that's an opportunity for me. He says, I will be there on Tuesday night. Tuesday night comes, John isn't there. You say, I wonder where he is. The birds, whatever form they come in, and he's not there. Somebody stole the seed, somebody robbed him of the opportunity. Guess what you can do about it? Nothing. Well, you could chase birds, but I'm telling you, it's not a good deal. You say, well, I'll get a hold of John. Talk him out of not coming, I'll go straighten them out. I'm telling you, you've asked for more than you can handle. Here's what you should do. Here's what the sower did. He kept sowing the seed. Here's what you can do. If you stay busy, sow more than the birds can get. Just depend on the law of averages, not trying to straighten out every problem. So, the birds are going to get some, some. Now, it says he kept sowing the seed, and now the seed falls on rocky ground, where the soil is shallow, and the little plant starts to grow. But the first hot day, it withers and dies. So, make a note. The hot weather is going to get some. You recruit somebody, and they join, saying, Hey, I'm going to really do great here, and two days later somebody says boo, and they quit. The first hot day, say what can you do about that? Nothing, because if you start chasing, trying to fix this, I'm telling you, it's unfixable. But here's what you can do to fix your future. Keep doing like the sower did, tap on sowing. And you can't be responsible for the shallow ground, that's somebody else's responsibility. So, here's the third key. Now, he keeps sowing the seed, and now the seed falls on thorny ground. And this time, the little plant starts to grow again, but the thorns choke it to death, and it dies. So, make the note. The thorns are going to get some. Here's what it's called in this little story. The cares of life, little duties, little distractions. I said, John, we had a meeting last night, how come you weren't here? John says, well, I can't make every meeting. I said, why not? He said, well, the screen door came off the hinges. You just can't let your house fall apart. You've got to take time and fix, fix, fix. I can hear the storm. He said, some extra trash piled up in the garage. You just can't let mountains of trash pile up in your garage. What can I do about that? People let little things cheat them out of big opportunities. And sometimes it's a little heartbreaking to watch especially if it's somebody you care about. But there are some things, remember, you can't straighten out. You've got to depend on something else for your fortune in your future. But now, let's go to the rest of the story. Here's what it says. Finally, 
The sower keeps sowing the seed, now it falls on good ground. Underline this. Good ground, and it always will. You keep sharing a good idea, it will someday fall on good ground, productive ground, receptive ground, decision-making ground. Now, it's interesting, though, about the ground. Here's what it said about the ground. Some of this good ground now produces 30, some produced 60, and some produced 100. What's that called? The law of averages. Everybody's not going to do the same. Everybody doesn't have the same ambitions, and you can't straighten this out. Now you just have to take it like it comes. It's like the seasons. You can't rearrange them and say, I'll take two springs, three summers, and no. You got to take them like they flow. But now, how do you get 100 percenters? Some will produce 100. How do you get more 100 percenters? You've got to go through the birds, and you've got to go through the hot weather, and you've got to go through the choking thorns. And you've got to sort of put up with those, you know, that haven't got much ambition. Get 3060 percenters, and you'll get some 100 percenters. The law of averages is at work in the university. Are there as many seniors as there are freshmen? Why is that? It's a mystery. The inevitable erosion of life says there's always going to be more freshmen than seniors. Not every race that started does everybody finish. The answer is no. Some people don't want to finish. Some people plan in the spring and leave in the summer, and you can't straighten that out. Here's what you can do. Keep telling the story. Keep sharing a good idea, and I'm telling you, it will work for you. So, here's what we say. If you want a lot of graduating seniors, you must keep loading the freshman class. Turn to the law of averages. It's one of the greatest studies to make. It'll serve you well in your business career, your sales career, any kind of career. One more on the law of averages. There's an old rule, and it's been around a long time, that says 20% of the people do 80% of the business, and 80% do 20%. And this is something you don't try to change or rearrange. It's part of the deal. Some might say, well, I'll just fire the 80. Say no, because whoever's left, 20% of them will do 80%, and 80% will do 20%. That's not something you mess with. Here's what. These laws are something you work with, something you understand, and you work with. 20 are going to do 80%, and it works everywhere. The pastor, the minister of the church, who puts up the money here to support the church, he says, 20% of the people pick up 80% of the tab, and 80% pick up 20%. Americans paying taxes. What's the deal? 20% pay out of the taxes, and 80% pay 20% of the taxes to run the federal government. This is not something you mess with. This is something you work with until you understand it well. How do you work with the 80-20s? Here's what you've got to do. Part of it's time management. You can only give 20% of your time to the 80% because they're only producing 20%. Now, you can give 80% of your time to the 20%. Now, remember, the pull is in the opposite direction. Guess who wants 80% of your time? The wrong group. Not in a moral question. The wrong group in terms of productivity and effectiveness in your business, your future. So, what's the answer to that? Here's part of the answer. You can work individually with the 20%. But you can only work by group with the 80%. However, guess who usually wants your individual time? The 80%. And you cannot do that. That's the law of averages. Here's the next important law, called the law of faith. We covered it a little bit earlier in a fairly simple form. Faith is the ability to see things that don't yet exist. Faith, though, can turn difficulty into positive reality. And I just want to give you this quick little lineup here because it's so important to ponder and then work it. Here's what faith is for. 1. Faith is the ability to see it as it is. Faith doesn't mind seeing it as it is because faith is a miracle worker. Faith does not ignore the negative. Faith uses the negative because if there was no negative, there'd be no need for faith. If everything is okay, what would you need faith for? You need faith because it isn't okay. What isn't okay? Who knows the situation that isn't okay? It isn't okay. So here's what faith does. 1. Faith does not ignore the negative because faith now stands as the miracle worker if you let it work. So faith sees it as it is. If it's ugly, it's ugly. If it isn't working, it isn't working. If it's a mess, it's a mess. It doesn't hurt to call a mess a mess. 
You don't need to fancy it up here. If it's broken, it's broken. If it's miserable, it's miserable. Faith doesn't mind admitting that. Faith doesn't mind seeing that. Here's why. Number one, you can see it as it is. That's the beginning of faith, seeing it as it is. Now, here's the second step of faith. See it better than it is. Couldn't you see beyond the mess? The mess is for today. Couldn't you look into tomorrow? The answer is yes. I guess I could look into tomorrow. Humans have this incredible ability to look into tomorrow, to look into next week. So, we not only have the ability to see it as it is, the beginning of faith, but to see it better than it is. Dream the dreams, make the plans, visualize, use your imagination, see it better than it is now. Here's the third step that turns faith into reality. Make it better than it is. Faith now must be invested in action. If you invest faith in action, you can take any situation and make it better than it is. Next, in the beginning of faith, seeing it as it is. Don't see it worse than it is. Don't blow it out of proportion. Some people have this tendency to blow it all out of proportions. That way, it can't be that bad. If it's this bad, that's how bad it is. You don't need to multiply how bad it is by 10. That's not necessary. Just as it is, that's the deal. See it as it is. Don't see it worse than it is. Now, here's the next unique key to faith. Don't see it for more than it can become. There's a thin line between faith and folly. Yes, it's possible to see yourself as a millionaire, but not overnight. Somebody says, well, yes, I can see that. Don't see it for more than it can become in a reasonable period of time. Yes, if it dropped out of the sky overnight, but that's not likely. But it's still possible to be a millionaire, to be rich and wealthy, given a certain amount of time, working with the law of averages and all the rest of the stuff we've talked about today. So, don't see it for more than it can become, so that you move in the folly instead of faith. Plenty is possible without being foolish in your faith exercise. But now, here are two more cautions. One, it might be worse than you first see it. You better look underneath because sometimes you just look at the surface. You better take a look so that you can really see it as bad as it is. It's not to overblow it now, but to make sure you see it as bad as it really is. Now, here's the next one. Give yourself a chance to understand that it could be far more in the future than what you can first see by faith. Here's all you can see. The miracles that we see here give us a certain amount of faith, but it looks like we need some more. We need some more, but you take the first step. Take the first step of what you can see, if possible to become, start believing that, have faith for that. And I'm telling you, as that starts to exercise, you'll be able to see it for more, and for more, and for more. The possibilities will start to increase in your own imagination. Now, make these notes in leadership, working with people. Learn to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it, because life operates by deserve. We studied that yesterday. Didn't the welfare people have said to Mary, Mary, look, I know you need the $400, but from now on, when I come back here with the check for $400, here's a bucket of paint and a brush. This little fence around here and the posts on the door have got to be painted. She says, okay, now, this little bit of paint's not worth $400, zero, but it's a step to begin the process of deserving it instead of just needing it. And you can start walking people away from need to deserve. Just let them take the early steps. Next time she comes and says, Now, Mary, if this is done and the weeds are pulled and all this stuff is done and the painting is done, and she starts to walk out, she starts to feel better because she's beginning to deserve it, not just need it. Isn't that big time philosophy, teaching people how to deserve it? Work with the people who deserve it. You say, Mary, if you take this step I take two steps, and then if you take two more, I take four more. But if you don't take the first one, I don't. Step by step, right? You call, I call. You try, I try. You move, I move. Teaching people how to deserve it. It starts to accelerate self-esteem. You can't believe what a high the beginning of new self-esteem is if a person hasn't had it for years and years, and they've been beaten down by their own philosophy and they've been beat down by everybody else. If you start them on the early steps, that starts this process of self-esteem. Self-esteem, the early self-esteem, is even more valuable than fortune because it comes at a necessary time. Leading people step by step into self-esteem, 
and self-esteem leads to action. Action leads to progress, and progress leads to fortune. What else do you want? So work with the people who deserve it. Now, here's the next key. Show people how to deserve your help. Next, don't expect the pear tree to bear apples. Let people do whatever they can do. You can hang apples on a pear tree, do all kinds of things, put up a sign. This is an apple tree, and then you get pears. So let people do whatever they can do, and let them change their mind, let them grow and develop. Here's what I found. You cannot change people, but they can change themselves. The best you can do is inspire and hope, teach and hope, teach and pray, and hope, and teach and pray, and inspire and pray, and hope. That's the best you can do. You can't get in there and change, but you can do your best to deliver the message that can create change if someone will accept it, if someone will do something about it. Take the early baby steps to get started and be happy with the smallest progress and get some rewards and a pat on the back and a big smile. Say, Mary, it's going to work for you. You've taken these two steps. I'm telling you, you can take two steps, you can take one under two. Next, all leaders must teach the fact that there is both good and evil. Here's the challenge for all of us. To become the most of the good in us and the least of the bad. The most of the good and the least of the bad because that resides in all of us. That's the beginning we talked about the other day of civilization. Becoming the most of the good and the least of the bad. But we must remember there is both good and evil. I did a speech one time called, The Day I Am a Wealthy Man. It didn't have much to do with money, but let me give you the list, and we're finished. I said, today, I'm a wealthy man. 1. Because of my heritage. All that I inherited that I didn't work for. It just, I was blessed with it. One was my parents, one was my country. I was blessed by books I didn't write. I was blessed by a library I didn't build. I was blessed by courts I didn't organize. I was blessed by airplanes and telephones. I'm blessed by all that I didn't create. I inherited it. I inherited a country that believed in democracy and freedom. I mean, once you start this list of heritage, it's just staggering. Next, I said, I'm wealthy because of my knowledge. Those that have passed their knowledge on to me has made me rich beyond belief. Here's what I asked for one time a long time ago. Unusual awareness. I want to be sensitive to what's happening. Unusual awareness. Not only the gift of knowledge, but what's happening. What's going on so that I can use my knowledge to the best of my ability? I only asked of my daughters two things. That's all. My daughters, I only ask two things. Here are those two things. One, the highest respect for all life. Two, unusual kindness. That's all I ask. The highest respect for all life and unusual kindness. Next, I'm a wealthy man because of my future. I have the pledge of goods and services of people you wouldn't believe doing business around the world, mega billions. You can imagine the extraordinary life I live. It's unbelievable. And the pledge of goods and services, the pledge of help and assistance, the pledge of camaraderie, the pledge of whatever. See, Mr. Owen, what else would you like to do? Well, just go do it. You know, you want to build your own country? Sure, we'll do that. I mean, whatever you want, we'll just go do it. Can you imagine what that feels like? So whatever you want to do, there's plenty of resources all around the world to just go do it. That is so staggering, it's just unbelievable for me. Next, I want to leave you with this little challenge. Number one, let others lead small lives, but not you. Let your life not be just acceptable, but memorable. Let others cry over small hurts, but not you. Let others waste their resources, but not you. And then here's two more, and I'm finished. Learn to help people with their lives, not just their jobs. We need to teach job skills, yes, but if you'll also teach life skills, weave it all into the teaching of job skills. Teach your children job skills, but then teach them life skills. And here's the last, my challenge for you. It comes from the old prophet. Here's what he said, if you work on your gifts, if you work on your abilities, if you work on your skills, if you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. They will make a place for you. If you become attractive, you'll have an attractive place. If you work on your skills, they will put you in unusual places. You don't have to worry about the place that is right now being prepared for you to qualify for the place. And if you work on your gifts, gifts of language, gifts of intelligence, gifts of faith, gifts of helping others, 
Gifts of influence. If you'll work on those gifts, you'll always have a place. I got to. That'd be one of the great examples. Look where my gifts have brought me to this place. I worked hard on my gifts. I worked hard on my skills. I worked hard on my delivery. I worked hard on my ability to affect other people with language and words and experiences. And then my gifts brought me to unique places now around the world because my gifts. I worked on my gifts and made myself valuable enough to be invited to these places. The same thing is going to happen for you, without a doubt.